in Gaza and how I should go. And for more on that story, we can speak to our international affairs commentator, Douglas Herbert. Hello to you, uh, Doug. Nibel painting a picture of chaos in Gaza. For those who can leave Gaza City in the north, what awaits them in the southern part of the enclave? A lot of the same of what they're leaving uh, in the north, to put it bluntly. There's a little bit of a, a lot of the international aid organizations, the UN, uh, they're furious at what they see as this this total uh, disingenuous uh, a tone in the the Israel's uh, order to evacuate North Gaza because Israel's official line is saying that um, you know at least we have the humanity to give a warning to civilians to tell them what is to come to let them leave others won't so, don't do that um, so they're trying to pitch it as a humane gesture to issue an evacuation order but the fact of the matter is as we just heard is that a they're being evacuated to an area including Khan Yunus which itself has in over the over this past weekend uh, been subject to airstrikes where uh, many of the buildings there are already uh, destroyed in ruins, perhaps not on the same scale and magnitude uh, of Gaza uh, City in the north and, and some of the uh, uh, the northern sectors uh, of Gaza, of course, which are closer immediately to, uh, to the northern border there with Israel, uh, but still subject to airstrikes. People along those routes verified videos showing that uh, a horrific uh, incident yesterday in which uh, perhaps, you know, dozens of people uh, were killed as they were already below uh, the, the outskirts of Gaza City in that southern sector, in a supposed zone that they're being told to flee to. So the reason there's a lot of outrage is that on the one hand, the Israelis trying to um, pitch this, civil, this, this evacuation order as something humane, as something trying to take civilians into account. Yet on the other hand, they are being told to evacuate to places that are A, not safe, under impossible conditions. And, you know, we've been talking about the hospitals where, uh, you know, one agency basically said that um, asking people to evacuate uh, some of these wards in these hospitals is tantamount to a death sentence. Um, when they get to the south, to especially Khan Yunus, which is Gaza's second city, uh, you already have hundreds of thousands displaced. And as of yesterday, the, the estimate was about 270,000 displaced, that is uprooted, evacuated people who have come from the north, 270,000 packed into about 100 schools that are run and managed by the UN uh, Refugee Agency, UNRWA. That gives you a sense. You could just try to picture in your head 270,000 people, you could do the math there, packed into about 100 schools. And those are the people who are lucky enough to maybe be able to pack into a and, shelter. And it's important to point out for our viewers, Gaza is a very small territory. 40 it's a very yeah. densely packed yeah. uh, enclave. Yeah, already 40 kilometers. It's blockaded and packed, been blockaded for 17 years. So you already couldn't get out before this war, uh, only under very strict conditions and under certain worker visas, which were granted for some Gazans. Uh, but 40, uh, 40 kilometers, about what, 25, 26 miles uh, from south to north. And uh, and depending on where you are at the widest point, about 12 kilometers uh, wide, but even narrower at other parts. So it is ex it's a sliver of land, a slither of land and extremely packed. You know, uh, Tom Friedman, who is a well-known Mideast correspondent, and he literally wrote the book on the region where he was a correspondent there from uh, called From Beirut to Jerusalem. He worked all across the region. He compared the strategy in a sense. It said it reminded him of what he called Hama rules. Hama is a, an allusion to the city in Syria. Uh, and back in 1982, uh, Bashar Assad's father, uh, Hafez Assad, uh, basically pounded, relentlessly pounded the city of Hama Hama because it was being threatened by uh, the equivalent of the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria, his regime that is. Uh, he pounded away, no order by, uh, for civilians to evacuate. And there are differing numbers, but Friedman estimates that some 20,000 civilians uh, were killed in those relentless days of bombardment of Hama. And he, he coined the term Hama rules, meaning a regime takes a decision in the name of military strategy and military necessity, as they say it, to pound away at a city or a sector that has civilians. Now, in this case, you might argue, as I said, well, but at least Israelis told the civilians to get out. The UN and other aid organizations make little difference between what, say, Haf Hafez Assad did 40 years ago in Hama when it pounded those civilians without giving a civilian evacuation order, and what Israel is doing right now, having given a civilian evacuation order, but one which is impossible to carry out. They say it's cynical, and they say that at the end of the day, they suspect Israeli defense forces know it, but they need 
need, they also are in a, a, a posture right now where they need to go after Hamas. Nothing's going to stop them from doing it. And even while they're paying lip service to trying to protect civilians, in the eyes of many in the international community, they are not doing so. This is equivalent to Hamas rules now being exacted against Gaza. That is a situation going from north to south. Is it a little better in the south? You could say, yeah, relative, right? They still don't have water. They still don't have food. The, the Rafah crossing, which could let aid in, is still blocked, uh, so nothing's coming in right now. They're ending up right now in a calamitous situation from one calamity to another, uh, out of the frying pan into the fire, as they say. All right, Doug, stay with us. Um, let's check in on that situation in Israel and the public's a reaction to its leadership. Hamas militants, just to remind our viewers, uh, killed over 1,300 people in the country in last week's surprise attacks. This Sunday, the Israeli Defense Forces confirmed that the number of hostages in Gaza is 126. And while visiting frontline troops, Israel's prime minister said the next stage was coming. Earlier, I asked freelance journalist Noga Tarnopolsky in journalism uh, in Jerusalem to find out uh, more. It's a kind of a different concept among Israelis of what it means to kind of fall under, get under the flag at time of war. Israelis don't associate the army or their draft call-up notices with Netanyahu per se. People have their own experience in the army. People are drafted here at the age of 18. They associate it with their commanders, their experiences. So what I would say to you is I think these, certainly those who have been drafted, those who are volunteering right now, feel a sense of purpose and a sense of mission. But it does not appear to, I don't see any indication. Netanyahu was a very unpopular prime minister before this happened because of his political plan. And I, I don't see any indication that anybody has um, changed their mind about him. This has been an absolute disaster for Netanyahu, who was the Israeli leader who advanced this doctrine that held that Israel could be fine with this terror organization ruling a whole territory at its southern border. That was Netanyahu's theory, and it has crashed and burned. Well, the Israeli military has closed the border area near Lebanon to civilians. Earlier this Sunday, the militant group Hezbollah fired a missile from inside Lebanon towards an Israeli border town, killing one person, wounding three others. Uh, the militant group released these images, which could not be verified. The village of Shtula, the small farming community in Israel, was the one that was struck. It's opposite the Lebanese town of Aita Ashab. Israel's military said it was carrying out strikes in retaliation. The U.S. Defense Secretary said he ordered a second aircraft carrier to the region to deter any such hostile actions against Israel. Take a look. 